Israel, Kwam Kwam Huyam Tesquik. Good day. My name is Kwam Kwam Huyam, which means strong, clear water. I'm also known as Joanne Archibald, and I'm from uh, Stalo Nation, and I also have Statlim ancestry in British Columbia. Indigenous story work is a term that I developed during my PhD research, and it's a term that um, a part of it comes from Kosilish ways, where in a cultural gathering, we have a spokesperson who will often say something like, my dear ones, the work is about to begin. So when we're in a cultural gathering, when we hear those words, then, you know, we stop our uh, talking and moving about and we know that it's time to pay serious attention to the cultural work that brought us all together. And so with the idea of Indigenous story work then, it, it's similar in the way that with Indigenous stories, and these could be traditional stories and life experience stories, that when we might see and hear the term story work, then it's time to become serious or pay serious attention to the work of stories or to find ways to work with, make meaning from and with Indigenous stories. So, you know, that's the meaning of the term Indigenous story work. Well, I'd say the aim of Indigenous story work is it, you know, it's it's multidimensional, really. That you know, our our indigenous stories really, I think, help us to be the best person that we can be or become, in the way of you know finding ways that we're you know good to ourselves to become a whole healthy human being, and also ways that we develop our values, our beliefs you know, about our relationships with others in our family and in our communities, and also how we have good relationships with our environment and the resources of the environment. So our Indigenous stories can help us um, do that. Maybe I, I want to return to the idea of the aim of story, Indigenous story work, and, and um, in this um, discussion, you know, I want to highlight the seven principles of Indigenous story work that include respect, responsibility, reverence, reciprocity, and holism, interrelatedness, and synergy. And I'll highlight, you know, just some brief aspects of each of these principles, but I'll, I'll mention that uh, they are included in this particular book. Indigenous Story Work, Educating the Heart, Mind, Body, and Spirit, published in 2008 by UBC Press. So if anyone is really interested in knowing a lot more, I'd suggest, suggest that you read the book and it will give you, you know, um, a much deeper, maybe, understanding of these uh, seven principles. Well, I think that... Um, the age groups really could go from uh, early childhood education. I started telling my grandchildren, ages three and five, some of the stories, Stalo stories. And I've also used stories with K-12, to uh, post-secondary education uh, students, undergraduates, graduates, and then practicing educators. So really, all the way from early childhood through to adults. And, um, you know, one of the, the questions uh, asked is, is how does Indigenous story work contribute to educational goals and priorities? So when I um, think about traditional Indigenous philosophies, you know, the, that goal that I mentioned earlier about becoming the best individual or the best human being that we can become, you know, is I think uh, an important goal that those, um, the Indigenous stories can help be a reminder about some of the values, um, such as respecting our environment or 
uh, ensuring that we have, um, you know, a positive uh, working relationships with people in our community. And I, you know, I, I feel that's part of the traditional philosophies. At the same time, I uh, think about the 1972 Indian control of Indian education policy, you know, where the principles of local control and parental responsibility, you know, were core uh, parts of that uh, policy. And the place of Indigenous culture and knowledge and language, you know, is, is, was positioned as very central to education. So I think that Indigenous story work contributes to those kind of goals because it really um, encourages people to work with, learn from and with um, Indigenous family members, community members, elders, cultural knowledge holders, and also um, suggest that Indigenous families and communities um, have control over their stories and how their stories are represented and how they are placed in educational contexts. So I think that Indigenous story work helps fulfill those goals of the Indian control of Indian education policy. And when we think of today with the truth and reconciliation, you know, calls to action, um, that the suggestions about uh, ensuring Indigenous curriculum is embedded within all levels of education, you know, and that um, students uh, develop intercultural understandings, empathy, and mutual respect. All that can happen through the processes of Indigenous story work. I want to... Um, maybe talk about the, the four R's as ways to get ourselves ready to work with Indigenous stories. So the four R's are respect, responsibility, reverence, and reciprocity. So when you think about respect, to me that's being open uh, to learning from and with Indigenous people, um, being, you know, open uh, to uh, learning how they, you know, have um, developed or uh, developed their Indigenous stories or, or ways they want to have them portrayed in education. I recall um, the late uh, Chief Simon Baker, Dr. Simon Baker, who often said that we need to listen with our three ears. So he meant, of course, the two that we hear with, but the one in our heart. And it's a way to listen, you know, in, in many, many uh, different ways. And so we can show respect that way, being able to be patient, um, to ensure that we are hearing what people are saying, and that we ensure that the people's, Indigenous people's voices and perspectives are given the space and time that's required to really listen, you know, to what they say and find ways to, you know, get ourselves ready to listen to the stories. And also to acknowledge and be aware that there's, there, there is diversity amongst Indigenous peoples, that, you know, there are many different types of stories there are many ways that stories are told in different settings. And so it's important to learn about what we call protocols that relate to story. So it's getting ourselves ready, you know, to learn um, a lot more about not only the indigenous stories, but all the, the cultural context that goes with them. So that's part of respect. Now, the other R of responsibility, you know, could mean to take time to develop working relationships with Indigenous families, community members, storytellers, elders. And, you know, that to me is, is so important because, 
as educators, if we want to uh, work with Indigenous stories, it really means that we work with the, the local Indigenous peoples, and especially the families and communities for um, of the students with whom we teach. And um, I know this could be from all levels, not only schooling, but through university. So taking time to develop those, those kinds of um, positive working relationships means that we are open to learning <clears throat> the story protocols that I just mentioned. And at the same time, it's being open to, to learning about the impact of colonial history because the uh, colonial history of um, Canada, you know, has had great impact on all people, not only Indigenous people, but everybody. And so as an educator, it would be important to understand, you know, the um, ways that the federal government, um, you know, um, uh, banned um, the practice of Indigenous cultures through law and thinking, you know, um, what what that does to a family or community when the deepest part of your cultures, you know, are denied. You cannot practice them. And that relates to our stories. So I've heard many of our elders say that, you know, during the time of the potlatch ban, uh, that the stories were put to sleep. You know, they couldn't... Um, and. And the stories are also part of culture and the practice of culture. So that was denied. So therefore, the stories were also denied. So a kind way that elders have talked about this is that they have, you know, have put the stories and some of the knowledge of those stories, and they put it to sleep for a while. So part of this understanding about the colonial history is knowing that now, you know, the, the stories are being reawakened and the knowledge that comes with them, you know, that is being revitalized. And that is a, a process that also takes time uh, to understand how, you know, the um, Indigenous, uh, how the Indigenous stories might have been told, were told in the Indigenous language to begin with. And then there has been a translation process from the indigenous language to English. And then sometimes it's a, a, a translation process that goes from the oral to written to multimedia. So a lot of things are occurring when stories are being revitalized. So part of the responsibility then of, of an educator, you know, is, is understanding you know, the, the, the impact of colonization, understanding the, the um, or recognizing, you know, the revitalization process that might be happening uh, in which to have the indigenous stories uh, used in education. I also think that part of the responsibility is um, we know where educators could learn more about, um, you know, the impact of uh, the Indian residential schools. And there, you know, um, people have told their life experience stories. And I think we can learn from those stories, too, because we could learn about, you know, um, the type of education received uh, or not received in those educational systems and kind of the impact of that on many people and generations of people where today, you know, there, there may be many Indigenous people that do not feel comfortable going into a school because of their experiences or their family's experience of residential school. So I think there's, there, there, there's that part of the recognition or responsibility of, of understanding that and at the same time, we could say, well, um, we can recognize the resilience of Indigenous peoples and also the resistance that Indigenous peoples have carried out in ways that 
they kept the stories alive in their hearts and in their minds, waiting, you know, for it to be reawakened. And so I think that's part of resistance. And so I think there's an appreciation I would hope educators would have by um, learning, by hearing, you know, learning about those Indigenous life experience stories. Uh, the third R of reverence, then, I think, um, you know, is, is very much um, aligned with a sense of spirituality. And, you know, that can be very subjective. And for me, I think of it as, as a way to, you know, um, take care of one's inner spirit. You know, some of the um, understandings that one may acquire after learning about the um, impact of residential schools may be very difficult uh, emotionally for people. And so, you know, I think it is important to... Um, to take care of one's spirit. And part of the reverence could also mean um, learning to understand the relationship that Indigenous people have to the environment, to the resources of the environment. Um, and in, in that way, the, the, many of our stories will talk about those relationships, that kinship, feeling of kinship that we may have to um, areas of the environment or place names. And the, the last R of reciprocity would mean that, you know, if you've been fortunate enough to receive the teachings, some of the knowledge, the understandings about Indigenous stories based on relationships, the respect, you know, responsibility that 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 one has carried out, then it's important to then give back, to share with others. And that is almost a form of what has been known as intergenerational learning, where, you know, we, we learn from those who have um, walked before us, uh, the elders, our grandparents, our parents, you know, and then we uh, receive their knowledge and then we have that responsibility to pass it on to the younger generations or to others, you know, who are interested. And by doing that, then that that keeps that story knowledge um, going. So I think, you know, with those ways, it, to me, that's really important work to do and takes time, takes patience to do all of that. But you know, that's part of what I think educators would would need to do to be ready then to uh, use stories in uh, respectful, responsible, ethical ways with their students. The other uh, three principles of Indigenous story work include holism, interrelatedness, and synergy. So, I'll, I'll use those, um, uh, or I'll talk about those, uh, in, uh, uh, and maybe connect them to, um, you know, how they how they could be used um, by educators. So when you think of um, holism, you know what that means in the context of Indigenous story work is um, a way of. Um, developing and strengthening our intellectual, our physical, emotional, spiritual self, our, our these, you know, sort of realms of human development. And within that, we also have these um, circles of influence, which would be oneself, one's family, one's community, and the wider society. So we think of you know, these, these circles of influence. And then um, in relation to that, it's the development of our, in, in my Indigenous Story Workbook, I call it Educating the Heart, Mind, Body, and Spirit. So that's part of the, the holistic approach. And so sometimes when we hear a story, you know, we might relate to... Um, um, are empathizing um, with the characters. Um, we 
you know, our various emotions, whether it be sadness, happiness, uh, anxiety, fear, you know, is that might be something we relate to as far as the characters in the story. You know, when you think about intellectual, it might be, you know, what um, new understandings um, that that come about as we think about the story. It could be forms of um, different forms of knowledge. When we think about the physical, that could relate to actions. Sometimes in the story, especially trickster stories, the trickster may get into trouble because the trickster forgets about or ignores the good teachings. And so the story may uh, um, stop abruptly. There isn't a clear ending. And the trickster is in some sort of trouble. And that is, in a, in a way, a signal for the listener to start to engage uh, with the story in some way, to think about, you know, what the trickster should have done or what the trickster could do to get out of the particular problem that the trickster um, finds itself. And the spiritual may, again, relate to, you know, our, our own inner inner feelings about um, and, and how we feel about our inner inner uh, spiritual uh, nature and we could also think about you know how um, the story may relate to you know our family for example you know and the different um, uh, emotions or feelings that we would have about our family <clears throat> in some way that the story triggers that feeling the principle of interrelatedness, then, you know, could be when two or more of those realms, that could be the physical and the emotional, kind of interact with each other. And, you know, think about, you know, some idea, some meaning that comes about um, from that story, especially if we think about the trickster and, and uh, try and do some problem solving and to think about, well, perhaps we should have, um, you know, had more uh, respect towards um, towards others. And because we didn't, we had some difficulty. And the third part, the very last principle then, is about synergy. And you think about synergy is more like when a, a spark happens, you know, when you might hear an idea, you know, that somebody else shares, and perhaps it triggers a, a, a thought or uh, maybe a new idea is formed or deepened. And so those, these three principles of holism, interrelatedness, and synergy could be um, used when an educator or teacher, you know, is then using a story uh, with their students. I thought of a Stalo story that might help us um, think about, uh, perhaps understand or use some of these indigenous story work principles. So I'm going to tell the story, but I wanted to point out that this uh, particular story is in a storybook that was developed um, through the work of Stalo elders. Uh, for um, elementary school uh, curriculum. And this particular story is called Mr. Magpie and Mr. Crow and was originally told by Harry Edwards from the Chiam community in the Stalo area. And Mr. Edwards, you know, was uh, a chief of his community for many years. And when this story was being developed by the elders, then another Stalo elder also remembered her grandfather telling a similar type of story. So, you know, we find that in our communities when people, you know, practice the oral tradition, you know, that stories will be um, common to that particular community. And so I'll... Uh, I'll tell this uh, story about Mr. Magpie and Mr. Crow. You know, and often in our stories, uh, 
the animals will take on different, um, you know, it almost becomes like human characteristics. And, and sometimes the smallest creatures can be good teachers for us. So with this you know, story, we always say, you know, sort of sit back, you know, relax, let your imaginations uh, be free to, to uh, uh, think about, to feel um, these stories. So one day, uh, Mr. Magpie told his uh, wife and his family that he was going to go out hunting for deer because their meat supply was getting low. And so he took his bow and arrow and he went out into the forest. And as Mr. Crow was by a small hill, you know, it was in a bit of a clearing, and as, as he was standing there, he saw something coming towards him, just rolling down that hill uh, quite fast. And then it was flat where he was standing, and when he looked down, he saw that there was a deer, and the deer had been shot uh, by um, another hunter that uh, with a bow and arrow, with the arrows. So... Mr. Magpie thought, well, it's somebody else's deer. So he very carefully removed the arrows because he didn't want to wreck them. And, you know, he wanted to be respectful to the um, hunter who had caught that deer. And so when he took out the arrows very carefully, he just waited. And a while later, the hunter comes by and he thanks Mr. Magpie for being careful with these arrows. And he said, uh, you can have this deer. You can take it home. <clears throat> he said, um, but what you will find is this. When you start out carrying that deer, it will be quite light and it will be easy for you to travel, you know, to your home. But when you get closer to your home, that deer is going to get heavier and heavier, he said. Um, and so Mr. Magpie thanks the hunter for his generosity, and away he goes. And sure enough, his uh, load is really light, and so he, you know, makes good time getting to his house. But when he gets closer, the load gets heavier and heavier, and he just barely makes it to his house. But he calls his family out and, and tells them the story. And they, they start to cut up the deer and, and uh, gave some to some members of the community. And they had a nice feast. While this was happening, his neighbor, Mr. Crow, was watching. And he was kind of jealous that Mr. Magpie had you know, gotten this deer and that everybody seemed to be very happy with Mr. Magpie. And so the next day, Mr. Crow decided it was his turn to go out hunting for deer. So he got his um, gear together and away he went. And he always went to the same area as Mr. Magpie had been the day before by a little hill. And he also saw something come tumbling down the hill very quickly and it landed right in front of him. And when he looked down, he saw it was a deer that had some arrows in it. Well, Mr. Crow was kind of angry because he thought, wow, how come, how come somebody else got this deer before me? And he's really not happy. So he proceeds to take the arrows and he pulls them out very roughly and breaks one of them. And, you know, he's still kind of... Uh, angry that he, he wasn't the first to get this deer. But along comes the hunter who shot the deer and, and he looks at the broken arrows, but he still tells Mr. Crow that, you know, you can take this deer home if you want. And he said, but what will happen is that when you start out, your load is going to be really, really heavy. And he said, but as you keep going closer to your home, the load is going to get lighter and lighter. 
And so that's exactly what happens. Mr. Crow is starting off and the deer is really, really heavy and he can hardly manage. But as he keeps going, he gets closer to his home. The load is really, really light and he throws it down onto the ground and he goes into the house and tells his family he's got a deer out there and tells him to get out there and cut it up and they go outside and they call Mr. Crow out and say there's no deer here on the ground and when Mr. Crow looks what he sees is a pile of bark from a tree. So that was the story of Mr. Magpie and Mr. Crow. Now sometimes in the traditional indigenous stories they sort of stop and there may not be a nice tidy ending to the story. And you know with this particular story you know there could be many different uh, meanings that one could um, make from the story. You know, when I, you know, heard it um, many years ago, I thought, yes, you know, perhaps this story is teaching us about respect, you know, where, um, you know, we're taught to respect other people's property and where, you know, Mr. Magpie respected, you know, the hunter and the arrows of the hunter and treated them respectfully. Whereas Mr. Crow didn't, and you know um, they were rewarded in a in a way that seemed applicable to, you know, the their behavior uh, about the arrows. And then after a while, I started thinking more about about this that you know sometimes we can think in metaphors too, where a story might. Um, uh, might make us think about, um, you know, uh, something such as the deer, maybe could be like our indigenous stories. So if we're like the magpie, you know, we might then have been taught and we practice, you know, ways that we'll treat the story respectfully, which means we treat the people and their knowledge in a way that honors that knowledge and you know where where we then are kind you know to individuals in that you know we um, perhaps you know take time to to practice that kindness and that respect and where perhaps if we don't, like Mr. Crow, if, if sometimes we're in a hurry, like I, I sometimes think as teachers or educators, you know, we want the answer now. We want the way to do something now. And which means we don't under, then really learn the protocols, the ways of treating people and their stories. And so when we use them, well, we might not get as much out of the stories as we could have. And in Mr. Crow's case, you know, the stories that turned to bark, well, it, it wasn't something that would feed the people, that would feed the families so they would be healthy, you know, and, and uh, be able to carry on in a good way. So I think you know our, that 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 particular story may help us um, maybe think more about how we would get ourselves ready. Um, those four R's of respect, responsibility, reverence, and reciprocity. So if we were Mr. Magpie, or maybe we we should say Mr. Crow, what could what how could we help Mr. Crow? become ready to treat the stories, you know, in a, in a good way. Not so part of that would be take getting, you know, taking some time and patience to learn from others. Um, 
And I think that's really important because often I think today we may not have as much patience as we we could have in, in our learning. Um, and, you know, then we could um, think about the um, understandings that we have um, or share those understandings with others. Perhaps if we, you know, think about a teacher um, in could be K-12, it could be post-secondary, to think of how a teacher might use <clears throat> this story of Mr. Magpie and Mr. Crow, perhaps once getting ready to, you know, um, with the four R's of respect, responsibility, reverence, and reciprocity, but then using it in a classroom where I have used this story with university students. And in that case, we started talking about um, leadership and trying to think about, well, here are the two characters, Mr. Magpie and Mr. Crow. Now, what kind of leaders, you know, uh, are they? And we then had um, a talking circle and where people in the talking circle you know, could relate or share their thoughts, their questions about, you know, the the type of leader. You know, Mr. Magpie was seen as perhaps, um, you know, somebody who's patient, who's kind, who um, cares about others uh, by showing he cares about others' property and, um, you know, and to think of, well, how does how does that make one an effective an effective leader? Whereas we think about Mr. Crow and somebody who, you know, is uh, disrespectful or who doesn't really care about others as much as he cares about himself, and trying to be you know someone who's um, uh, <clears throat> you know who wants in a sense uh, the glory of being somebody out front. Uh, so, you know, it's a way that perhaps the individuals um, in that situation talked about aspects of leadership. And then um, also thinking about, you know, what, what might that deer symbolize? And then we also wondered, well, the hunter, you know, we raised questions. Now, why did the hunter then um, decide that he was going to give both characters the deer, you know. Um, so that just, you know, is a way that we could, you know, start to um, uh, explore other ideas. Um, sometimes another pedagogy that I have um, experienced is with the uh, late elder Ellen White, Kawasalwit, um, <clears throat> of Kosalish peoples where uh, you know, she was a wonderful storyteller and she often said, you know, sometimes when you hear a story, you can just go away, take it away and think about it and maybe dream about it. And then there's a time then you can talk to somebody else that, is, that may have heard that story and sort of, you know, as, as you're talking about that story, something that somebody says might tickle a thought, as she often said, you know, or tickle a feeling, and that way you might share that, and it becomes a shared story. Of course, with um, younger children, you could role play, you could have puppets, you know, and it's a way that be it, that could become a shared story about, you know, uh, being, you know, Mr. Magpie when you're being kind and gentle, or sometimes you could be Mr. Crow and where you're not being gentle with others and you're a bit rough or, you know, and, you, and there are important things to uh, consider in that way uh, and the implications of types of behavior. And so I think, you know, in that way, sometimes a story that's shared, you know, becomes a common reference. And so the teacher then could just use that story to say, oh, remember Mr. Magpie, Mr. Crow, and and what happened, um, you know, to um, 
to, to them and their families when they um, weren't respectful or when they were respectful? Well, I think the success of Indigenous story work, you know, would really depend on, you know, what the goals of um, the uh, lesson were for uh, what intention the educator or the teacher had in mind when using the story. And so if part of the goal was to see, you know, um, the reaction of the students, were they engaged, were they involved in the discussion, um, you know, did they talk about their feelings, uh, did they talk about or did they write about or did they draw, you know, some of the uh, behaviors or actions or be involved in problem solving. So one could go back to that holistic approach to see, you know, what what might um, a student learn or share uh, a meaning about the story, kind of the intellectual, maybe user creativity, you know, what might they have felt, you know, what actions, what problem solving might they suggest, or how did it make them, you know, feel as, as um, you know, uh, uh, as, as who they are. And all of that could be either oral uh, in discussion or it could be in written form or it could be in acting, it could be in drawing, it could be making up a poem, a, a song. Uh, so there are many different ways to assess the learning. And then the other part would be, you know, just being aware of, you know, are the students, you know, talking about the story another time, you know, maybe a, a week or two later, did they remember the story? Did they remember the, you know, different parts of the story?